Yeah. So this morning, what I wanted to do this morning is I want to finish up this series, and I know that some of them's going to say, man, I wish I'd have been there, and I'm going to say, don't leave. You know, come to church on Sundays, always be here and have a good time. So how many of you in here would admit this morning you like taking tests? Would you raise your hand? I know there's not a young person here that wants to raise their hand. No, yeah, Sandra's cheats off of Linwood's tape, test. I know what she does. So what how most of us in this room don't like, I mean, when you have to go to take your driver's test, you, if, you know, if you don't get a ticket during that time, you don't have to take your driver's test. There's some of us in this room that have to take the driver's test all the time. And, and so what happens when we go to take a test, we get real nervous and, and, and all that kind of stuff. I remember in seminary when I was at Southeastern, uh, I was taking uh, uh, Hebrew, and, you know, I had already taken uh, Latin in college. And, you know, the old saying about Latin, it killed the Romans and it'll kill me, you know. And in Hebrew, we just go, oh, we're going to die. We're going to die. And so what happened, we get nervous and we get upset. But the Bible teaches us about testing ourselves in a different light, in a different form. It's not to give you a grade A, B, C, or D, or E, or F. But what it's designed to do is to show you where you need to work at. Some of us in this room, when it says, in the gifts of the Spirit is love, man, y'all, y'all got that stuff down pat. Except when Clemson lose, y'all like to pick on the preacher. So what happens is that some of you in here are so natural at doing things. But what happens, the Bible's teaching us, we need to face life. I mean, Friday night, I've, I have to admit, I've lived around here a long time. I don't remember it raining that hard and that fast of a period of time. And, and, and it's okay that it did because the Lord had everything. But some of you got caught out in the weather and some of you were driving. Uh, some of you were at ball games and all that kind of stuff. And, and it's totally understand, but you had a test when you were coming home. The test is, will you follow the, the common sense things that you need to do? The speed limit is 55. When it's raining that hard, you do not drive 55. You drive 10 mile an hour, and you drive like granny. So it's a test that we will sometimes listen and use what the Bible has taught us. So I, I want to give you this verse. It's from the translation called The Message. It says, test yourself to make sure you are are solid in your faith. This is a thing that is what is killing the church today is that we're not solid in our faith. We'll do and fall for anything. And we need to be people that are solid in our faith. And it goes on. It says, don't drift along taking everything for granted. You cannot take granted for anything because today we might be here and tomorrow it may be worse. In the book of Job, we know that Job is on the, he's the richest man one day, and the next day, he's at the trash pile, if you will. He says, give yourself regular checkups. Now, some of us, we go to the doctors, we go to see, we go to the dentist, we go to the eye doctors, and we do all these trying. But in our spiritual life, we need to be the same way. We need to do regular checkups. And you need firsthand evidence, not heresy, but that Jesus Christ is in you. The test sometimes that we have is does Jesus come out of you in, when you're out in, in the world, out in your job, uh, out in, at Walmart today, if you happen to go there? Is will Jesus come out of you? And he says, test it out. This is how we get better and stronger when we are being tested. Then it says, if you fail the test. So let me do a survey. I can't help it. How many of you in here would admit you failed a test in the past? Okay, all right. Y'all are in the right church. We're going to help you to, okay, I just got to have fun. Um, take out your worship folder, that little piece of paper you got. Take it out. You, I want you to hold it, okay? All right, okay. Look on the back. Look on the back if you're here for the first time. If you come to my class, you cannot fail. I just gave you all the answers. And they're even spell right, I think, this morning. So what happens, God gives us, listen to me, now here's where I'm trying to go. God gives us all the answers of life right here. And this is where the people say, what? 
Okay, some of y'all need to say, oh me or oh my or something. One more time, amen. Okay, so what happens in this, he says, take it out, test it. If you fail the test, do something about it. Do something about it. So, I hate to even bring this up, but I'm going to anyway. How many of you have ever been on a diet before? Raise your hand. Okay, let me get to the bad part. How many of you failed the diet? Okay, you see what I'm talking about? We, we want to do something about it, but sometimes, I mean, I don't know about you, but my birthday was Thursday, and I know I don't look like I'm, I'm that old, but I, I had a birthday, and, and I had a test, and the test was is that Sharon had made me a pound cake, and she knows how much I love them, and then, so I got a pound cake over here, and then Anita made me those chocolate pies, see, so what do you do with this? Do you just have a little piece of this pound cake and look over there and go, bless it's hard, the chocolate pie is over there. Or do you do what I did, eat the pound cake, run over here and eat the chocolate pie too? You can't be on a diet and do that. So I'm trying to hold in so I don't look like I've gained any weight this way. So what happens, we have tests, but we got to do something about it. He says, we just don't put up with limitations, we celebrate. So what, what's happening here? Paul is writing and he's telling us there's going to be times in our life we're going to be weak. There's going to be times in our life we're going to have faults and make mistakes. So I want you to turn to your neighbor and I want you to tell him, but it's okay. Go ahead. It's okay. So when we do this, what Paul is telling us, it says we're testing our actions and our attitudes and, and they're about what God commands us to do, do we match what God is telling us to do? The proof that a person is a Christian is not because they say a prayer or claim they are Christians. It, it, the proof is in the transformation and being transformed in life. How we handle situations. How do we deal with situations? When someone does us wrong, the Bible is clear how to handle it. And so we need to make sure, and the only way we can do this is allow the Holy Spirit. When we get saved, the Holy Spirit temples inside of us. And when we do, we have to allow the Holy Spirit to move in us. For example, yesterday, when we got to the second half of the game, uh, we had a drug problem. You remember I told you about that. We got drugged from one end of the field to the other. I, the best thing I could do was leave. See, that way, if I'm watching it, I'm liable to, to do something wrong. So the best thing to do was leave and not watch it. So I was praying that when I got back, a miracle had happened. We needed five miracles yesterday. So the point I'm trying to tell you is, is I'm not trying to push this to a point, but I want you to understand, you need to test yourself a little bit. So we can't change our lives until we understand our identity, and our identity needs to be in Jesus Christ. We, can't be, we cannot become all God created us to be if we don't understand, we're going to have limits and limitations sometimes. But we must embrace who we are. I don't know about you, but I ask myself this question. Who, who, whose are you? Who's my Savior? Jesus is. Whose are you? I am His. Who do you belong to? Jesus Christ. Who are you serving today? Jesus Christ. That is the answers to the test. If you're a Christian, you need to understand you are going to make mistakes sometimes. So I just thought about what about these faults and these mistakes or an unattractive or unsatisfactory feature is a piece of work that it has in our personal character. What happens is that there are things that get me fired up. So if I ask you this morning, could you name one thing that would get you fired up real quick? Most of us in this room, if you start talking about our young'uns, we get fired up. You know, if you talk about our grandchildren, we will kill you. I'm just kidding. What happens, we get fired up about certain things. Some of you in here will get fired up about a football game or whatever, or, or whatever it might be. What happens is that we have to understand when we make mistakes and have faults in our face in life, uh, there's a responsibility for that. And, and accidents do happen, yes, and that's why they call them, but we need to make sure the problem is, is that the error in humans is to cover it up. We, we make a mistake. We want to cover it up. We don't want anybody to know about it. 
We, we don't want no one to know. We don't want nobody to know what we're doing. We don't want anybody to know about our faults. We want to act like we don't have any faults. So I want you to turn to your neighbor and ask them this question. What's your faults? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You go, I ain't telling you. I'm not telling you. And, and, and I, I saw the wife a while ago look at her husband and go, there's too many to say. So in our lives, our faults and stuff are important that we understand that. What about unintentional things? I, I don't try to do things that upset people. Do you? Some people, some people do things just to get you fired up. I, I remember in the older generation, my daddy liked to aggravate my mom, and, and he wanted to know why she didn't speak to him. <laughs> yeah, when you intentionally do things, that's going to happen. You know, it gets into the quiet game. But I've learned from the book of Leviticus, if I was looking the Old Testament, it says if a man or a woman sins unintentionally, that is made known as he is to bring and offer a goat. Now you say, what, what do you mean? They offer sacrifices. If we still lived under the, the, the Old Testament, we would have a run on goats. Because some of us make a lot of mistakes, me first and foremost. And so what happens to us is that we need to understand Faults sometimes, when we make a mistake, they're not necessarily sins. Most of them are, but sometimes it's not. We, 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 we don't know something, we ask a question, and maybe it's the inappropriate time. We didn't mean to do it intentionally. But what we need to understand is, is that sin, if we look at, this could be sin and false if we basically are weak and we keep falling. It's like going on a diet and, and eating chocolate pies and eating um, pound cakes that Sherry makes, and then when you put strawberries on them and let the stuff pour on, you know, it, it really is terrible. It's, oh, you know. So the point I'm trying to make is, is that you and I need to understand we have habits in our lives that we need to get rid of, and we need to test them this morning to make sure. See, sometimes we don't realize that some of the habits that we have are, are bad habits. They're actually faults in our lives. For example, let me give you one. Maybe you're a boss at a company. Maybe you're the head of something. And you have someone in your group who's not carrying their weight and you start punishing them. I hate to tell you this morning, but that's a sin. What, what about someone you don't really, you, you, you don't like them as much as you used to and you give them the cold shoulder? That's a sin. Because that's not how we need to be. I know that sometimes... Or maybe this morning you or a person has mood swings. <laughs> and, and your attitude gets kind of bad when things don't go your way. So let me do a survey. One more here right quick. How many of you like things your way? Every one of you better raise your hand. <laughs> so we, we, we like things. But I want to tell you the difference between faults and weaknesses. Number one, uh, the difference in a fault is it's a defect. Like if you buy a Ford, you're going to have defects, and they're not going to be. A fault is like a blemish or, or, or deficiency or something. A weakness is something that's a condition that we have. We, we fight with it. Sometimes weaknesses, we, as we're working through these weaknesses, we have the lack of strength to fight through them. Weaknesses are everywhere in the New Testament. I want you to understand, in Scripture, this is what we base our church on. This is what we base our Christian walk. It's God's word, the scriptures. Jesus told his disciples that our flesh can be weak in Mark 14. Uh, Luke writes it that Paul's voice refers to weakness of those who are economically at disadvantage in the book of Acts. The Corinthian believers were weak in social issues. The book of Romans tells us that Jesus died for us while we were still weak. He he died for us in Romans 5, 8. We also are weak in our prayer lives sometimes, and we lack the words and the know-how. And then there's fellow Christians who are weak and, and can't get past judging people. I mean, they just love to judge people. And then we have physical infirmities. Uh, I, I, I know some of you may feel like this morning, I can't do what I once did. And, and you physically are not able. Some of us, as we get old, we can't do what we once did. And then there's what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12, the thorn in the flesh. Some of us have thorns. Paul had a thorn in the flesh, and God had a reason for that. 
And, and it was to keep him humble. Because, see, Paul had the same problem that I do. We can get real arrogant and cocky sometimes. And God reminds him, this is not about you. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say these words. It's not about you. It's about him. Okay? Okay? I'm trying to get you to talk to your wives this morning, okay? Okay. So, so in this, if you don't have the courage to face your faults, you're going to just constantly dig and dig and dig and get the, the problems going to get deeper and deeper. Um, the other day, I, this has been some time back, but I was at something, I was in a, a little program that was back when I was at Keystone on the board of directors there at Keystone. Uh, I had a lady, uh, she had become a believer. She had went through our program at Keystone, and she had become a believer, and she was so excited. And if you've ever noticed a person who receives Jesus Christ, I love being around because they motivate me to get excited. And, and a, new, a new believer, they're just, they just deal with life, and they're not worried about anything. They're not, and they're, they have one reply. The sun is shining today. I'm alive. I love being around those kind of people. They just, they just give me energy. And, and we should all be like the new believers every day. And, and, and in fact, this lady was, she, man, the Lord has set her free. Uh, her name was Bobby Joe, and she had been set free from drugs and alcohol. And, and she had been saved for about six months. And, and we were, I came into this little thing. We used to be a breakfast we used to have once a year. And I went into this beautiful place, round tables. They had everything you want. Scrambled eggs, grits, flat sausages, homemade biscuits, and all the best jellies in the world. Are you hungry yet? And, 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 and they had beautiful place settings and round tables. And this lady was determined when she found out that I was a pastor and I had her give her testimony. She wanted me to sit with her. And I said, okay. So we went over and there was a gentleman there. Uh, and he was of J J Japanese descent. And, and as we came by, and I really wasn't going to sit because I was trying to, there were some folks I was looking for. And she said, oh, pastor, pastor, come sit with me. I said, okay. Because how are you going to tell somebody No. And, and so I look at her, and I sit down, and she turns to this gentleman who's of Japanese descent, and he says, I, I can't, she said, I can't remember your name. She had already introduced her, and he told her, and I, I, I couldn't pronounce his name, so I called him Mike. That was easier that way. And um, she said, this is the pastor uh, who I know, and he's part of our board of directors. And she said, I went to church one day, and it changed my life. And he said, and she looked at him, and she was so excited about Jesus. She looked at him and says, well, do you go to church? And he said, no, I, I'm Buddhist. And she said, uh, that's all right. Just come to church with me, and it'll change your life. And I'm sitting there going, she's got more boldness than I got. And then, then she said, she said uh, no, he said, I have my own religion. She, he said, I give my money to Cancer Society and the Boy Scouts. And she said, that's fine. You just come to church with me. Just, just come to church with me. It'll change your life. And for the next 20 minutes, this guy gave every excuse you could have given this poor lady. And, and she kept saying, he could have said, I'm, I'm, from, I'm a Martian from Mars. And she would say, it's okay. It's all right. Just come to go to church with me. It'll change your life. She kept saying this over. Let me tell you something, friends. As a pastor, you can't teach that type of evangelism. The Bible says in Psalms 139, search me, O God, know my heart and test me. And know my thoughts. See, when we embrace our weaknesses, God can use us. And, and God's wanting to use your weakness this morning to point people to Jesus Christ. I, I don't know about you this morning, but we need to take a test. We need to evaluate. And some of the other translations, it says, examine your life. See, as a Christian, you're not going to know anything. It's like when you this morning, I hope you did this. Um, that you got up and after you showered and everything, you got your toothpaste out. You know, and, and you get the toothpaste, and some of y'all are terrible because you squeeze it in the middle. Don't do that. Some of us who come behind you have to roll that up, you know. And, and so it's like toothpaste. You don't know what's in that tube of toothpaste until you squeeze it. You see, this is what happens in our lives, in our Christian lives, often our weaknesses are because we're not squeezing the toothpaste out. So what is your part? What is my part? Well, it's real simple. You and I must check, our, check out ourselves. Um, in 2 Corinthians 13, 5 from the NLT, he says, examine yourself. We need to look at our lives this morning. 
and we need to, so I got a short test I want you to do. Now, this is not in your, this is not in your handout because I didn't have enough room. Um, so let me just give you a little short test that you can do. Am, am I obedient? When God speaks to me, am I obedient? Uh, are you growing in your walk with the Lord? Are you and Jesus growing together? Is your walk evident to other people? When people see you, do they know that you're a Christian? And do you share with other people? That This is important. This little simple little test that I just give you is just designed to help you to know that we need to be obedient to the Lord. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. And matter of fact, sometimes it will not be popular. And sometimes people will fall out with me. Are you living for Jesus or are you living for yourself? Are you worried about you being happy or do you want Jesus to be happy? Are you growing? Do you spend time every morning in the word and praying and, and trying to help others? These things are evident to people. So I have a story I'd like to share with you. This, I, I've been reading a new book and it's, it was about this man. And his name was named William Bolden. Uh, he was from a very wealthy family in Chicago. Um, that was back before they killed everybody on the streets every day. And in 1904, 1905, he was 18 years old, and he traveled, he, he, he got to travel around the world, you know, I, I, and it's amazing. And after he went to Yale University and to Princeton Seminary, uh, he was committed to go share his life with people of Islamic faith. And so he was wanting to go to China, and, and it was very difficult, so he decided to go to Egypt. So before he left... He had $500,000, equivalent to $20 million today. And at age 23, he had already been serving on the board of Moody Institute. In 1913, he left for Egypt and never looked back. God had spoken to him to do it, and God opened the door for him to go, and he went. He was being obedient. In his final year, because of, he was in Cairo, he contacted meningitis. And as he lay dying, he scribbled this note. And here's what he said. No, no reserves, no regrets, and no retreat. He had done what God had called him to do. He was obedient. And, and what he learned to do, you and I must deny ourselves. And we've got to quit being on defense all the time. When we, in our lives, when our faith is walking, we, people point out something to us and we get all upset we need to deal with these faults that we have. Uh, enemy is going to focus. The devil is always going to focus on your weakest point. You need to know that. He's going to focus on that. And, and some of us in this room will say, well, I, I, I don't sin. But you do sin. You don't always realize you're sinning. And, and what happens is you may think you don't sin, but your wife and kids know the truth. And you say, well, I'm not going to keep anybody out of heaven. You may keep your wife and children out of heaven by how you act. See, we all have character issues. And, and, and I don't know about you, but some Christians walk into the room of our lives and they, they brighten our room up. And then other Christians walk in and we go when they leave, praise the Lord. Um, and then sometimes when they get to, when the, when, and, and you get to heaven, the angels go, oh, no. And and so we got these problems that we deal with. You and I, one of the things I've learned in this test that God opens up to Christian people today in America is we got to stop the blame game and blaming others for all of our problems. We, some of us in here need to make allowances for other people's faults because sometimes I, I'm beginning to decide they just don't know no better or they wasn't raised any better. I'm one who just can't stand people who are walking along and there's trash and they walk over it instead of stop and pick it up. I, I despise when I see Christian people who mistreat people in public at a restaurant or at Walmart. It, it, it just gets on my everlasting nerve. That's not how to solve your problems. Uh, I, I can remember, I, I don't know about you, but if I had been your child, uh, you would not want me to go to Kmart with you. And, and I remember, remember the last words my mom and daddy would say before we got a truck, I will tear you up in there, and I will tear you up when we get home. Now, for our young people today, that, you don't know what that word means, tear up. That means you're going to get your butt whooped. <laughs> I, get, I, I got a lot of them, okay? 
I got a lot of them. Is there anybody else like me here that need to raise your hand? Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> See, Danita, was a, well, she was a preacher's kid, so we want to make sure. So what do we do? So here's the question this morning. If I'm going to look at my life, and I got to face life, and I got to deal with some faults, and I got to deal with mistakes, so what do I do? You got to identify. Not everybody has the same problem in here. We all have problems. But sometimes we need to identify the thing that's causing us to be weak in our life. And what the whole thing is, is in 2 Corinthians 12, it says, uh, Therefore, in order to keep you from becoming con conceited, I've given you a thorn in the flesh. This is what the, the Lord is telling Paul. This is why I did that. It was to keep him humble because it's so easy to become real, think you're better than everybody else. And, and in, in, in that same scripture, it says, My grace is sufficient for you. For by my power is made perfect in weakness. See, for I am weak, he is strong. And I can do all things through Christ, not of me, but through Christ. Uh, maybe some of you in here this morning, you, you think you're perfect. So I was going to do a survey, but I'm not, okay? So let me tell you a story about a friend of mine. <clears throat> he was telling me about this about two weeks ago. And I started laughing at him when he told me this. He said, he, he went to the doctor, and he said, Doctor, listen, my wife has got a major fault. She really has a really, she never listens to me. Don't look, husbands, don't look at your wife right now. No. She never listens to me. She never really answers me. Really. She never, when I ask questions, she didn't answer me. And, and, and the doctor said, well, how old is it? And he said, she's like 60. And he said, maybe her hearing is going. He said, well, maybe that's the reason she don't answer you. Maybe that's the fault that she has. And he said, well, maybe she don't. I hadn't thought about her going deaf. He said, well, here's what you do. You, you need to do this little test. He said, you walk into the kitchen in your normal tone of voice, and you just ask a question. If she doesn't answer you, you take two steps forward. That ought to be, he, he's dumber than I thought he was. You take two steps forward and ask her in the same amount of voice. And then she doesn't answer. He says, what you do, you take two more steps toward her, and you ask her again at the same level of voice. And he says, you'll know approximately the distance. And finally, he said, and then you discover her hearing loss. So he goes home. He ain't real smart. So he goes home, and he does the test. And she's cooking when he walks into the kitchen. She's probably making country-style steak, creamed potatoes, fried squash, fried okra. And she's probably got a peach cobbler in the oven, too. And he stands by the door, and he says, Mary, what's for dinner? And she just keeps chopping carrots. And, and two steps forward, he makes again. He says, Mary, what's for dinner? And she just keeps cutting the carrots. He says, Mary, what's for dinner? And finally, he got right up to her, and he says, Mary, what's for dinner? And she looks at him and says, for the fourth time, it's beef stew. Sometimes it's not the other person. It's us. Turn to your neighbor and tell them it's us. <clears throat> so what does, the, what does this mean? It means that I have to accept this way that it's God's design my life. Now, listen, listen. some folks do have hearing problems. Um, I know that many of you husbands in here, you have this problem called selective hearing. So, so what happens to us, we do that. So let me show you this. It, it means I need to stop complaining about everything. See, this is the problem we have in America today. And then we have this problem in the church as Christians. We complain. We, we complain about things and, not be, and, and we're not satisfied with anything. And what we've got to learn today is that Christ's power is made perfect in the weakness of you we begin to realize we need to embrace weaknesses. And, and we, need, we, we need to make sure that we're trusting ourselves. But here's the problem. We think we're doing this Christian life on our own. We think we're doing it. And in fact, it is not us that we're doing it through Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Some of you are riding bicycles when you ought to be driving a Ferrari or a good GMC truck with a diesel engine. And what happens to us, we start, we start looking at things and we don't realize that we think we can conquer it. We can't. 
And I don't know about you, but we, we kind of look at some things. I remember when I first came here. This has been years ago, and there was, I don't know, probably 40 people, 50 people, and we were trying to grow this church, and I had a guy come to me, and he said, do you know what kind of people you have in your church? And I didn't know what to think when this guy was telling me this, and I thought, okay. And he said, you see that girl over there? He said, um, she was raised by her grandmother, and her grandmother was kind of retarded, and I don't like that word. It's, it really upsets me when people say stuff like that. And he said, you see that guy over there? And I said, yeah. He said, he's got an ankle brace. He's under house arrest, and the cops keep watching him to see if he's doing anything. And he said, you see that couple over there? They're, they're, they, uh, they're not married, and they've been living together. And he said, see that guy over there? He's just got out of prison, and he's been growing dope. Um, and he, he looked at me, and he said, um, you got a bunch of sick people in your church, preacher. And he walked off, and I thought, what? For a moment, I thought, there are a bunch of sickies here, you know? I got to thinking, that, that girl doesn't act strange to me. I see the guy with the ankle brace, but, you know, I'm, I'm not really worried about him. He was growing dope. That's wrong. The Bible says it is. And I started thinking, and the Holy Spirit said, you know why I brought you here to be the pastor? And I said, Lord, I don't have a clue at all. He said, so that you could pastor these people. He said, there's a lot of sick people who need Jesus Christ. He said, there's a lot of people here who have been through their lives and been condemned and pushed down. And I'm bringing you here to lift them up. So as a Christian, yes, I, you are sick. I'm sick. I'm the biggest sinner in the group. And, and, but what we have to do is we have to work together and help each other. We need to have the right attitude. We need to quit trying to cut people off. We're trying to amputate relationships. We've got to stop doing it. Some people, we just have to love them from a distance. And see, what happens in all of this, God is expecting us to help everybody around us. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I do things at my own fault trying to help people. And when people come to me, I try to be honest with them. I don't do it in a bad way. Matter of fact, if you come to me today and say, can you tell me what's wrong with me? I'm going to tell you, I got to go eat lunch. I would pray about that because I'm not your judge and you're not my judge. What we got to do is we got to understand when God speaks about a fault in our life or about a problem, he is saying we need to prioritize things. Yes, everything is worthless, he writes in Philippians 3, when compared to the value of knowing Jesus Christ. These things that we struggle with in life, the Holy Spirit points out these things. And here's what's important to find. We got to have the courage to deal with. Do you know why we don't have the courage? Because we don't really believe in the Holy Spirit. Did you realize that the Holy Spirit knows everything about you? And the Holy Spirit knows everything that you're going to face this week. He knows what you're going to face next month and next year. The Holy Spirit can help people when they come together and and fall on their faces and say, please help me. Please help me. And as we begin to look at this, we begin to understand is that we need to be people. He's going to locate us and he's going to find us and help us. You cannot run from the problems of your life. I, I'm, I love when I'm around people. When I first became a Christian and I've had other times in my life, I'd have people around me and just says, hang on tight. Just hang on. We're going to do this together. I, I like people when they begin to touch certain issues in our lives and they tell you, I want to help you. God wants us to turn our faults into access, something that can be beneficial. He says, we know that God calls us all things to work together in Romans eight twenty eight, for the good of those who love God. Because God has a purpose in our life and he wants to move us in a direction so we can help other people. When we're strong in abilities or resources, we're tempted to do it on our own and not do it through God. See, pride will get in our way. And we say, well, I don't have that problem. But see, everybody's got a problem. And we need to help them. And, and we need, if, if you and I will cooperate with God, God will begin to show us what we need to change in our lives. Our goal as a Christian this morning a goal is a saved person who loves Jesus is to be like God. 
We want to be like him. Wholeness and completion. He says, for I am weak, I am strong. This is what Paul keeps saying over and over to us this morning. There's areas in your life that you're struggling in. You need to give it to the Lord. He is strong to do whatever he wants to do. He'll do it through you if you'll let him. He is good enough to not to even spare his own son, but he loves you enough to die on the cross so that you can have the power to do these things. So I want to talk to you this morning as your friend and as your pastor. Maybe you're here for the first time. I, I want to talk to you this morning. I want you to know that God loves you. I want you to know that this church loves you. And I want you to know if you have a prayer, you get with our prayer team, Bill, and those will help you and help us. And these people, when I say pray for you, I'm talking about these people pray for you. Morning, noon, night, and whenever else, they have a moment. And they'll pray for you. You and I this morning need to look at our lives, and we need to ask ourselves a question. Am I really saved? Do I really know Jesus as my personal Savior? And, and then we need to look at our lives and then to ask the question, am I doing what God has called me to do? Listen to me. I love this church. I, I love seeing our church people, when, when our guests come, they just love on them. And I want us to be a, the most loving church there is. I want us to, to make sure, uh, matter of fact, uh, next Sunday night at, uh, what time is that thing needed, 536? What time am I supposed to preach? Yeah. Four, it starts at 4, and then the service starts at 530 or something, right? Okay. So what will happen is uh, Sandy and came up with this idea this morning. And I said, okay. She said, I got this idea for next Sunday night. And I said, good. I thought maybe she was going to have everybody wear orange shirts with the Clemson Pauls or something. No, she's not. Uh, the idea was she was going to put it on there on a T-shirt, Yates Interpreters. Is that what it was? <laughs> and and what if, there's about 3,000 people that were there last year. Once they find out I'm preaching, it won't be that many. But, but what happens, it'll be Yates Interpreter. There'll be people going around looking, sitting there, and they'll spread out, and they'll go, what did he say? <laughs> and, and then y'all can interpret for them because y'all been under my guidance here for a while. The point I'm trying to get to is, I want you to, I want you to get past yourselves. I want you to realize that preachers are not perfect. I want you to realize that your neighbor is not perfect. I want you to realize the life group leader you have is not perfect. I want you to realize the people that work with your children and work with the youth and all that, they're not perfect people. And we need to do our best to help each other. We need, we need to be people that are coming together. What would you do if you saw someone crying this morning? Would you just walk by them and go, bless them, Lord? No. Christian people who are loving people will stop and say, is there anything I can do for you? You see, this is what's lacking in our walk with the Lord. And you say, what do you mean? You've got to love people where they are. And you've got to help them where they are. And you've got to move to where they are. So, well, what if they've been mean to me? Move to where they are and, and do what Jesus would do. In this story, this is why I love the chosen so much because they make it kind of almost so real, is that we, Jesus had struggles with people. Do you struggle with people? Would the world be better if people weren't in it? Only you. You see, this is the attitude that we have sometimes. But I'm begging you this morning, to look at your life and, and realize that everybody is weak. And we need to pull together. And we need to help each other. Next week when everybody comes back from their vacation, don't ask them this question. Where was you at? Why weren't you in church Sunday? You just need to say, I'm glad you're here. Okay, so turn to your neighbor and say, I'm going to, let's, let's practice it. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm glad you're here. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, see, we got it down pat. We know what we're going to do. And I want you to say to your neighbor this morning so they can be a witness, I'm going to do better this week. Steve, you got to talk to her whether you want to or not, okay? I just want you to be people that realize that we're all in this together and we're doing the journey and the struggle of life is real, but if we all pull together 
and do what Jesus would do, we can get through this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. With every head bowed and every eye closed for just for a moment, I want to pray for you this morning. I am so glad you're here. I, I, I'm, I just am so thankful that you're here this morning. And I just want to encourage you this morning with every head bowed and every eye closed. And maybe we just need to say, Father, thank you so much for your grace on our lives and our understanding that we have a purpose. And when you locate a fault or something that happens or something is pointed out that it's a tough for us to recognize, help us to find the courage to face the faults in our lives. And then I, I just want to pray for you this morning that you would be a group of people that you won't deny that. You'll receive it and not deny it, but you would try to do something about it. And I want to beg you this morning to quit blaming other people for your mistakes and for your problems. I'm not asking you to sweep it under the carpet. No, I'm not. And nor do I want you to kick it down the road. I'm just asking you to prioritize it. And I want you to think about the maximum of how to be obedient as a Christian, that you would get up tomorrow morning and you would study and spend time with the Lord and pray, that you would try to serve other people this week. I want you to maximize your obedience to Him. And when that moment comes, and more than anything else, you're going to be overcome by problems of the world, you'll just fall on your knees and turn it to Jesus and give it to Him. And Jesus says, I'll take care of that. This morning, maybe you're here today, and you're just struggling. You don't know which way to go. You don't know what to do. I, I just want to ask you, this week, just pray, God, show me. Get in the Word, listen, and God will show you what to do. And this morning, he's saying, start here. Start fresh. Start right now, trusting me. And so, Lord, as we come in this service, we're going to take a moment. This altar is open. People are praying. And that, Lord, today, we will face life with you holding our hand and walking through it and being like Jesus this morning. While we wait, whosoever will, if you need to come, the Lord, this altar is open for whoever will say, just come. Just give it to the Lord, whatever it might be. So, Lord, I just want to come right now. There are people in this room that are struggling. They've got decisions that they got to make today. They got to go back. Some of our students have to go back to school Tuesday or Wednesday. And I pray, Lord, that they'll be able to stand firm. And I pray for our adults in this room that we would understand we all got faults. We all got struggles. Help us to overcome, Lord, I pray. And, Lord, we love you this morning. We need you, Lord. As the old hymn says, I need thee every hour. And I just pray this morning, Lord, that you would help us. That we would walk with you and talk with you all along the way. And Lord, as we start testing ourselves this week, that you would reveal to us the things that are holding us back from being that witness for you. God, help us to do our best today. We love you. Thank you for your son, Jesus, going to the cross at Calvary, dying for me, dying for every person in this room, people that are watching by live stream. And Lord, this morning I pray that when we face life, we'll do it with you. And all God's people said, amen. Let's stand and worship the Lord. Here we go.